Hi friends, another uh, Bible study. This is on the incarnation of Christ. Now what's that big word mean? Uh, incarnation literally means embodied in flesh or taking on flesh. It refers to the conception and the embodiment of a deity or a spirit uh, in some earthly form or the appearance of a God as a human. A central doctrine of the Christian faith which affirms that God took human form in the body of Christ. In other words, God was, re was incarnated in human flesh. Christ was both fully human and fully God at the same time. That reminds me of the word reincarnation, which is the idea that people can be born again and again uh, and come back in different forms. And that's uh, a paganistic idea from India and other places. And I believe that that's really not the Bible way at all, not the Bible teaching at all. Because uh, it says that um, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. One life, one death, one judgment. You know, basically, uh, is the Bible teaching. So, I think that the incarnation of Jesus, Jesus coming into the world and becoming a human being, you know, coming from heaven to be a human being, uh, was the single most important event in the history of the planet since the creation of the world. Uh, from the sin of Adam and Eve to the flood in Noah's day, Messiah's coming to earth was the great hope of mankind to be redeemed from sin and death. Oh, that's our great hope. Ever since uh, Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of, uh, of Eden, the promise came that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. And so that's what we all are longing for. And so Jesus did come. Praise the Lord. But why did Jesus incarnate? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Everybody should accept this. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's the plan. That includes all of humanity because we are all sinners. What percentage will be saved in the end? That remains to be revealed. There's some mysteries. We don't have every single answer. But let's consider the birth of Jesus Christ as it is written. Details are provided, but questions persist. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19 to 25. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1. says, uh, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It happened this way. When as his mother Mary was espoused or engaged to Joseph before they came together sexually in marriage, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. What? She was pregnant with the Holy Spirit. How could that be? Then Joseph, her husband, being a just or a righteous man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded in thinking about how to put her away privately or secretly. You know, back in those days, you know, the law of Moses uh, called for uh, stoning to death those caught in adultery. And... Anyway, he, he, he did love her, and he just wanted to put her away secretly because uh, it seemed to him that she had uh, cheated on him and been with another man. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you son of David, do not fear to take to you, marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I mean, uh, miracle. This is the greatest of all miracles. <laughs> You're the family chosen to uh, to raise up Messiah for God's people. I mean, whoo. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Not in their sins, but from their sins. Jesus means Savior. Uh, some get... Like uh, 
the Hebrew expression Joshua or Yahshua, uh, however you want it, Yeshua. I've heard many pronunciations and spellings for it. Um, but the English translation, Jesus. Uh, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. His name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. How awesome is that? God came to dwell with human beings. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him or told him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, did not have sexual relations with her till she had brought for forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Uh, Jesus uh, was the first, uh, her firstborn son, not her only son. She had, uh, she had uh, several other sons and, sis and also daughters. Jesus had brothers and sisters, but he was the firstborn, and he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The other brothers and sisters were conceived by Joseph, Joseph and Mary together. And so this is quite a miraculous event, uh, praiseworthy both in heaven and on earth, and there's a lot to this. <clears throat> so let's continue here. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The birth story in Mark is just... The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The good news of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And then it just continues from John the Baptist to his crucifixion, resurrection, and so on. Uh, then we go to Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 27 to onward. <clears throat> i just read it here for you. Okay, so we start here in uh, verse 26, Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, both Joseph and Mary were their uh, descendants from the house of David. The promised Messiah seed would come from, you know, David, from Abraham, to, from Adam and Eve. It's a train of descendants. And the angel came in unto her, Mary, and said, Hail, or hello, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. You are very blessed. And when she saw, she was troubled in, at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. What is this? You know, it's not every day we get a visit from an angel, right? From a special message from heaven. And the angel said unto her, Do not be afraid. Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb, in your belly, in your uterus, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? I've never had sexual relations with a man. How could this happen? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, John the Baptist. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, unable to get pregnant. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So Mary says, okay, if this is what God wants, I'll accept it. 
This is pretty amazing, uh, miraculous stuff here. So, there's only uh, one baby born in the human race that is called that holy thing. Jesus was holy from birth, and he never sinned his whole human life of 33 years. A perfect life, a perfect righteous life. And that cannot be said of me or of uh, any of, uh, of the other descendants of Adam, Adam and Eve. We're all born into sin. We all need a Savior. Jesus was born holy. He lived a holy life. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted to sin, but like Adam and Eve, you know, that forbidden fruit, they were, he was tempted, but he did not partake of that forbidden fruit. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He... Uh, was beat up, tortured, and crucified, an innocent, holy man. But he provided an atonement for sin. He provided a way of escape that we can live. Our sins can be forgiven because Jesus died for us. Okay, in John's Gospel, John's birth, uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 1 through 14, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. Um, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Is Jesus God? It says right here, the Word was God. Jesus is God. And all things were made by Him, by Jesus. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So Christ is creator of all things. You know, the Father gives the instruction. Jesus carries it out. And He wasn't alone. The Holy Spirit was with Him. So the Word and the Spirit worked together to create. Like Psalms uh, 33, verse 7. For by the Word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So by the word and by his breath, by Jesus and by the Spirit, all things were created. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not, did not recognize him or acknowledge him as such, sadly. Uh, and the word was made flesh, born into the world as a human being, became a baby, and and dwelt or lived among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of Christ is his holiness, moral purity, goodness, righteousness, loveliness of character, sweetness of disposition, kind, forgiving, gracious. He was the most wonderful human being that ever lived. No man ever spoke like this man. Did Jesus uh, have a pre-earth birth in heaven many years ago before the world was created? Are the Father and the Son just titles and metaphors to better relate to a foreign and alienated God? Or is the Father and the Son a legitimate relationship similar to how we relate to people in our human culture? Can you have a father and a son without a mother? Think, think about it. Does the Bible specifically state that there is no heavenly mother? What about this statement in Galatians chapter 4, verse 26? But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So the Apostle Paul acknowledges and writes that we do have a heavenly mother. Her name is Jerusalem. Now we could sure use a lot more detail, couldn't we? We just have to go by what the Bible reveals. Is the Holy Spirit a, a person? Is the Spirit a he or a, a her or an it? Is the Godhead without gender or with gender? That is, with or without reproductive organs. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse uh, 29, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words, all the words of this law, that we might obey God's law, which is to love God with all our heart, love our neighbor as ourselves. So we have to accept what has been revealed from God, about God. We have much info, but there are still endless questions. We will have to wait for more light to be revealed at the proper time. So, the patience of the saints, right? Personally, I believe Jesus was born in ages past before he came to earth as a baby. That is why he is the Son of God even in Old Testament times. Jesus says, 
in uh, Revelation 3, verse uh, verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now what does that mean? The word creation used here is a mystery of sorts as to how it relates to the Son of God. I mean, there's different ways of interpreting that. Is Jesus the beginning of the creation of God? Did God create Jesus first before anybody else? A lot of people argue Jesus was not created. He was born. He's the firstborn, right? So, does that mean Jesus began the work of creation? He's the beginner of, the, of creating everything uh, in the world? So, there's different ways of interpreting it, and it's one of those texts where it's kind of difficult to understand. Galat. Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 15, Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Christ was born first. Revelation chapter 12, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing or laboring in birth, and was in pain to be delivered. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's God's law, I believe. And the child was caught up, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So Christ came into the world, lived and died, rose again from the dead, and went up to heaven, ascended up to heaven. And he's to rule all nations with a rod of iron. God's law. <clears throat> now what does the, this heavenly wonder woman symbolize, or who is she? I think of her as Mother Jerusalem or as Holy Spirit. She cannot really be Mary because she is standing on the moon wearing the sun as clothing and wearing stars on her head. Most interpret her as the nation of Israel and later on as the church. For example, you know, Jesus was born among the Jewish people. And and also it goes on to say that she gives birth to the saints. The rest of her seed, the remnant of the rest of her seed are children, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so she gives birth to Christ and to the saints. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians, I, I labor in birth again to, that until Christ be formed in you. You know, he was taking on the idea of giving birth to the Galatian believers that Christ be formed in them, and the righteousness, the goodness, the love of God be formed within their, their beings. And that's, that's the, the gist, the essential meaning in a nutshell of what it means to be a Christian is to have the Spirit and the Word of Christ dwelling in us so that we can bear fruits to the glory of God, so that we can do good work, so that we can honor God by doing deeds of righteousness and make, being a blessing in the world that we live in. So we have to admit here is a mystery, and we don't have all the answers. First Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. And without controversy, without argument, great, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest or revealed in the flesh, justified or approved in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world. He's believed on to this day and received up in the glory. So that's the life of Christ. He is God, God in the flesh. And he was believed on in the world. To this day, there's many churches praising Jesus' name and received up in the glory. Christ went up to the Father at the right hand of God. So this verse heavily edited in almost all modern Bibles, using Sinaiticus as their manuscript. Uh, this The received text that the King James Version is based on, the 6,000 plus Greek manuscripts, says that God was manifest or revealed in the flesh. This is the offensive part that has been altered or changed in the modern Bibles. And this, the Sinaiticus was a manuscript found in a trash can in a monastery. And Tischendor claims to have brought forth this modern Bible that's supposedly older than all other manuscripts. And that's the one that the modern Bibles are based on. 
And so they edited and altered many parts in these modern Bibles. Many verses are just completely removed. A lot of uh, word, key words referring to the deity of Christ have been removed. And so, but that's why I, I, I lean on the Old King James Version, even though it's a little bit more challenging to understand at times. But I feel like I'm getting the essence of God's Word by uh, studying this Bible. So the angel came to Mary with a message that she would be the surrogate mother of the Messiah, Christ's child. The Mormon church teaches that the Heavenly Father had inter intercourse with Mary. I don't agree, because that would involve adultery, fornication, which is contrary to God's character. I think that the Holy Spirit implanted the sperm seed of Christ in Mary's uterus and impregnated Mary. I don't think of this as having sex. Whether the act was pleasurable or not, only God and Mary knows for sure. Again, these are mysteries. We don't have all the answers. It is an in incredible to consider how the Prince of Heaven condescended or stepped down to become transformed into a sperm seed. Jesus really had to trust Holy Spirit because of the vulnerability of this transaction of His being. It's still a mystery to this very day. There's the idea of teleportation, going from one place to another instantaneously at the speed of thought or whatever. So Christ, as the Prince of Heaven, became a little seed in Mary's womb, in her uterus, and became a human baby. That's, that's the mystery of the Incarnation. But how about you? Do you think that God has gender as a male, female, or no gender at all? The hermaphrodite has the reproductive organs of both male and female and can potentially impregnate himself to give birth. This condition is extremely rare in human beings, but some animals or insects have this capability. Is God like that? Does God have both male and reproductive and female reproductive organs? Is God one person or a divine family of beings? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The androgynous has both male and female characteristics. They may look male and have female, a female voice or breast. They can behave and act as both genders. Is God like that? Does He sometimes act and sound like a man and sometimes act and sound like a woman? Effeminate? Uh. <clears throat> then there is binary fission. <laughs> this is a simple reproductive process that one-celled organisms can use to split in half. Like say you've got a one-celled amoeba, protozoa, and it can, or bacteria, and they can split in half, and then you've got two of them that look just about exactly alike. Some people hold the belief that the father... Father God gave birth to Jesus Christ. They quote Jesus as saying that he proceeded forth from the Father and came out from God. So do you think that the Father split apart and became Father and Son? That's what some people believe. Uh, they also degrade the Holy Spirit to being the shared spirit of the Father and Son with no individuality, personality, or being. <clears throat> May the force be with you. God is the spirit is just a force. It's a has no intelligence, no personality. Some people believe that. Some think of God as an alien, foreign being that is very different from humans. A, a, some kind of a body of energy or something. The position I take is to let the scriptures decide for me, acknowledging that much info is not revealed at this time and to use reason and common sense while under the influence of the Holy Spirit in coming to my conclusions. What about the angels? Do they have gender or reproductive organs? I think that God has gender and reproductive organs because human beings are created in the image and likeness of God as both male and female. I don't think the angels have reproductive organs, at least not ones that work like ours do. Maybe this is the main difference between humans that are in God's image compared with angels. We're a different order of beings from angels. And yet angels might be jealous of humans because we, as in God's image, can reproduce our own kind. 
We can have babies that grow up to be adults, right? But they cannot. And maybe humans are jealous of angels because they do not die like we do. Also, angels have some special powers, it seems. They can shapeshift into male or female genders. They can take on the appearance of the deceased or our dead loved ones. Practice voice recognition while imitating people's speech, people who are long dead, even. Take the shape and appearance of animals like dogs or cats, even mystical creatures, unicorns, <laughs> UFOs, aliens, fairies, dwarves, and others. They can do some pretty amazing things, the angels can. Now, God has forbidden us to have contact with and communicate with familiar spirits, demon spirits, fallen angels, because he knows that they will betray us. They will lead us far away from God and the Bible. They will lead us to destruction and die without Christ. That's what they want. And so they are not our friends. They are our enemies. And so God is very specific. Uh, do not have anything to do with wizards, warlocks, witches, sorceries, you know, astrology. This is forbidden knowledge. Uh, don't trust in that. Don't go to that for guidance and advice. We have the Bible, the inspired word. That's where we get our counsel, our advice from as, as Christians. Mariology, the study of Mary. Marian worship. Mariolatry, Mary idolatry and so on, is a practice of Mary worship as the mother of God. This is contrary to the Bible. Worship of Mary and the saints is a form of idolatry and is offensive to God. Now, when we were reading earlier about Mary and Elizabeth meeting together, and Mary begins to praise God. And Mary says, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Mary never claimed to be divine. Mary felt and believed she was a human being as anybody else. And she rejoiced in God my Savior. As we do as Christians. The Roman Church changed the gender of the Holy Spirit to male. Created the Trinity Doctrine and caused their version of Mary to replace the essential roles of the Holy Spirit. They worship Mary as an intercessor for the human race. And they believe and they believe that Mary prays for people and forgives their sins. Also, the Roman Church doesn't like or agree with the idea that Mary had other sons and daughters with Joseph after the birth of Jesus. And so the Roman Church took on a lot of false doctrine. They uh, exalt tradition, their traditional beliefs above the Bible. And that's why they steered off the path of holiness and moral purity and gone the way of darkness and sin. The worst sins imaginable are, are done in the Church of Rome. The Vatican City rules over the kings of the earth by her ambassadors, the Jesuit representatives. And they will stoop to the lowest sin to get what they want. They're the richest and wealthiest organization on earth. And they are guilty of the blood of the saints. They have slain the saints of the Most High God, killed them, martyred them. And in the end, God promises that Vatican City will be destroyed with fire, burned up, and, cease, you know, and be no more. Vengeance, the vengeance of God's temple. Okay, so going on in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse uh, 30, 39 and on, we, we, we were reading about how the angel visited Mary. And now, the, now uh, Mary, she's excited about what the angel told her. And so Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country in a hurry to the city of Judea and entered into to the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Hello! And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. That was uh, later to become John the Baptist. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. And she certainly was full of joy. 
And she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, the baby Jesus. And how is this that you have come to me, the mother of my Lord, should come to me and honor me with your presence? For look, as soon as the voice of your salutation sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, Mary who believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. So, so let's consider some of that for a moment. The baby in Elizabeth's womb was to become John the Baptist, and this infant somehow was full of joy in hearing the voice of Mary. Baby John must have recognized the divinity of the baby Jesus, and who was inside of Mary's womb. Obviously, babies know far more than modern doctors give them credit for. And what does that say about abortion? Babies are really human beings in the womb. This is something to think about. And when we abort a baby, we're killing that child that could be grow up to be an adult. And the world has loved and cherished abortion, even since earliest times. You remember in Egypt, the Pharaoh said, kill all the male children of the slaves, of the Israelite slaves, kill their male babies. And uh, how Moses, he, was, he survived during that time. And why did he survive? Excuse me, the big trucks going by. Moses' mother decided in her mind, I will not comply. I will not obey this mandatory. I will not obey this law. I'm going to save my child as, as, as much as I can. She prayed earnestly. For three months, she kept baby Moses hidden. But he would cry for milk, you know, and he couldn't. She got to the place where she couldn't hide him any longer. So she put him in a little basket in the, in the river, Nile River, and, flo and his sister, Moses' sister, older sister, Mar uh, older sister Miriam, Mary, uh, in the Old Testament, she followed the, the basket of Moses floating down the river, and it went by the palace of the Pharaoh, and his daughter was out there taking a bath with her assistants, and they saw that basket, and she called, and they brought it to her and opened it up, and inside was the baby Moses. And she felt sorry for that baby, and she decided to take that baby and raise that baby up as her own. And Moses' sister Miriam says, Hey! I, I know a, a nursing mother that could care for that child for you. And so Pharaoh's daughter paid Moses' mother wages, money, to raise this child for the palace of the king, uh, Pharaoh. And so that's how Moses grew up in the palace of Pharaoh. <clears throat> so Mary is the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Elizabeth testified. But God never design that Mary should be worshipped as an idol. God is a jealous God in His love for humanity. Exodus 20, verse, verse 1 to 3. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is a prohibition against statue worship. God is jealous of our worship and service to Him because of His love for us. It's a jealous love. You're, you're jealous of your wife. You're jealous of your husband. You don't want them to uh, cheat on you, to betray you, to give yourself to somebody else because you're married to that person. And God wants to be married to us in a sense of our love and bond and our relationship with each other. He does not give his glory to another, but God honors those who honor him. <clears throat> so God takes this relationship very seriously. In the Roman church's version of the Ten Commandments, they remove the second one forbidding image or statue worship and divide the Tenth Commandment into two commandments, which forbids lusting or desiring your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife. Have you learned something new or received some inspiration from this message? May God bless you in your own reading and study of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, the Incarnation of Christ, it's a study that we can go on for hours and hours. I'm going to wrap it up right now. 
And uh, thank you for tuning in. God bless you in your Christian walk with the Lord. God is good. God answers prayer. And those who war and battle with Christ for the good of humanity, we will win. Christ is going to win this war. And those who love and follow Christ and do the will of God, we're going to win with him. God bless you, brothers and sisters.